Welcome to Recorded History, your monthly podcast exploring historical happenings in southeastern Connecticut. I'm your host, Lee Howard, the Day.com community editor, and my guests today are Jade Huguenin and Martin Smith. Jade grew up in Mystic and has been a community organizer and youth mentor, now living in Idaho. Martin is an adjunct professor of English children's literature at Rowan University in New Jersey. Together, they have written a new book, Postcard History Mystic, published by Arcadia Publishing, in which they have put together a fabulous collection of old photographs of scenic southeastern Connecticut village that straddles the towns of Groton and Stonington. Welcome, Jade and Martin. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. All right. Well, I think we should mention right away that uh, Jade and Martin have put together a panel discussion about local history, uh, specifically uh, Mystic and Groton, that will be held uh, at noon, August 18th, 2018, at Groton Public Library. So uh, what day is that, and what can you tell me about the panelists? It is on a Saturday. It's from 12 to 2.30. each one of the panelists worked on a different book from Arcadia Publishing in the History Press that had to do with the Mystic Groton area. Um, and it's one of those things where it's rare. You rarely see an area that has so much history dedicated to it that can justify nine volumes, but that's how many books are here. Um, and, and we've got panelists that is diverse from you know tenured college professors to Vietnam veterans, former mayors, uh, community organizers, uh, people just starting out in academia, retired librarians, uh, people that do haunted ghost tours. Oh, so good. <laughs> there's a big variety of um, people that are involved with this, and we thought it would be fascinating to kind of get everybody together and let them talk. Great. I know Jim Streeter, who was one of our first uh, podcast victims uh, here, uh, <laughs> uh, is one of your panelists. Uh, who else? Uh, any people you can uh, name by name that people would be familiar with? Dr. Fott. Right. Dr. Leif, uh, Leif Fott. He is a tenured professor of history at Lemoyne College up in Syracuse. Um, she wrote uh, probably the most detailed academic work on mystic in the area. Uh, and it was published through the History Press in 2007, I believe it was. Just a fantastic volume. We actually re- used it to reference when we, we were writing our volume. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yep. And then, of course, Jim and then Lisa Saunders, who everybody knows. Uh, yeah. She co-wrote the, mod- uh, the Images of Modern America Mystic book. Uh, Haley Keeler, who used to run the library. Mm-hmm. Um, she's retired sure. now. Um, Courtney McInvale, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. She's uh, the one who runs the ghost tours. Yeah, she runs mm-hmm. the uh, Haunted Mystic Ghost Tours. Uh, Bill Tishner, who helped Jim write the book that Jim wrote on um, the Groton Mystic Emergency Services. And mm-hmm. then Lou Aylin, who is the president of the Mystic River Historical Society as well. Okay, great. And uh, why, did you, why did you decide to put this panel together, and what do you think local people will get out of it? Well, it was fascinating. Uh, I've written six of these books now in six different geographical areas around the country. And one thing that I ran into when we were working on this volume was that the names in the community were known. With the Philadelphia work I did, for example, everybody's kind of spread out. There's different generations of people. But with Mystic, you had a very kind of tight-knit community of historians. And so I thought it would be fascinating to get nine people with very not, nine very distinct writing styles together in the same room and let them talk about the different areas of history that they're experts in. Um, Jim, of course, is a, as you know, is a wealth of knowledge, um, and, and you know he makes new discoveries once a week. Uh, it seems. <laughs> um, he writes a column for the Times papers, which are run by the day as well. So mm-hmm. we like to have him write us a column once a month. Yeah, and they're always fascinating. I think we refer- we used a couple of those as reference points while we were researching. Um, but I mean, but you have people that are career academics, and you have people that were just doing this because they were passionate about the area. So we decided to put them all in a room and, you know, let them talk. Okay. Yeah. Great. And a big part of it, too, is that, you know, history, history historically has been taught through dates. And on this date, this boring happened. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, really boring stuff. And bringing people together for a panel in person, all together in one room where we can talk mm-hmm. to people, to people, not at people, like you're lecturing. Right. I, it's a really interactive format. So it's something new. It's open to the public, which mm-hmm. was a huge uh thing for us we want we want the public to be able to access this and enjoy it and kind of see it come alive and talk to real people who wrote this right yeah well i think one of the main questions people are going to have is how did mystic come to be i mean it's such a weird place how, how many places is a town that's not really a town it's a village <laughs> but it's in <laughs> oh two different goodness, towns yeah. you know it's just a weird thing so yeah. how did it come to be 
Well, how it is today is not how it always has been. Today, we know it as a tourist town, but that's a pretty recent development. That started to happen around the 1980s, uh, late 1990s, maybe even early mid-1990s, actually. And so it started as a, as a, as a whaling and, uh, and shipping town. You know, it was, it was not really <laughs> as glamorous a place as it is now. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, – there was a lot of labor that came in, you know, it's the story of the working class, just like, in, you know, pretty much any small town in, you know, the United Post-Native States. Post-Native American. Yes, absolutely. Of yes. course. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The natives were here for right. oh, <laughs> much longer than we have I would been. Hope so. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. And, and then you end up with, you know, the Dutch and then the English and then, you know, it evolves into what it is. Um, so, is, I'm sorry, is mystic a native uh, uh, term, or did is that something we came up with? <laughs> it comes from the term mistituck, if I'm not mistituck. mistaken. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, and so the name just kind of evolved because the English, you know, they made it English like they make everything else. Yeah, so. mistituck is a, is a Mashantucket Pequot mm-hmm. uh, term. And I believe they uh, spoke a form of Algonquin, and mistituck um, means something... Oh, geez, I'm on a blank here. I'm trying to something remember. Something about it all. the yeah, it's like the tide between the rivers. Yes. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, and so that's. I'm glad that the name at least stuck. It's not spelled the way it used to be spelled. Right. Um, mm-hmm. On the Groton side of the river was a Mashantucket Pequot. Uh, sort of settlement mm-hmm. um, and it um, went on that way they partnered with the Dutch for a little bit um, and then in the 1630s the English came here and kind of <laughs> kind of messed that all up <laughs> as the English tend to do <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and right. yeah, so that that part of the river actually used to be called uh, Portersville, okay. and um, we discovered through the course of our research that the reason why it was called Portersville, um, I guess Portersville derives from the term uh, port, which is kind of like a doorway, mm-hmm. um, and on the Groton side of the river, when the English got here, um, John Mason kind of led this expedition mm-hmm. um, through that side of the, the those banks of the rivers into the Fort Pequot, mm-hmm. and um, essentially committed one of the first acts of genocide. On mm-hmm. yeah, it was a horrible atrocity. Uh, absolutely, and absolutely. You, and you had a statue uh, to him for for many, a long many time. Years. Yeah, and yeah, yeah I they think they moved it to Windsor, if I'm not mistaken. They did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they moved it far away. And now we have Johnny Kelly, the famous mystic <laughs> yes. runner replacing yes. it. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I got my mystic pizza. <laughs> I, I think it's a, a, a much better uh, thing. Uh, I used to know him well. He used to oh, write a tennis column. For, so or, I'm sorry. He, I wrote a tennis column for the day, and he wrote a running column for the day. Yeah. And we used to run <laughs> into each other here in the halls uh, quite often. He's yeah. a great, great guy. So tell me a little bit about how your book came to be, and what is Arcadia Publishing all about? Well, as far as the book goes, we were both in college at the time. Um, mm-hmm. I was down in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, and Jade was uh, up here at Smith College. And um, we had known each other. I'd been to Smith a couple times to visit classes that she had been in and everything else. And she kept telling me, you have to come see my hometown. You've got to come see my hometown. And I was like, okay, well, let's do it. And so I came up, and just like with anybody else, I'm sure I fell, kind of fell in love with the place. Mm-hmm. And so I had just finished my first book with Arcadia Publishing. It was on Powhatan Village in Philadelphia. And I was like, we should write a book on Mystic. Mm-hmm. And Jade was like, yeah, let's do that. And so we ended up doing it, you know. <laughs> and um, a lot of research, a lot of nights spent in Jade's parents' house in the living room, <laughs> going through postcards and writing captions and rewriting captions. Um but the stuff that we found out was fascinating, um, mm-hmm. and Arcadia kind of gave us the freedom within, you know, 100 words, obviously, to write what we wanted to write about the images that we were dealing with. Yeah. 100 words per image. Oh, per, boy. Per image, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's hard to condense a lot of that history into into just 100 words. Yeah. Well, they, they say a picture's worth a 1,000 words, but to Arcadia, it's a tenth of that, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Now, uh, you have uh, mentioned to me that uh, there's a big link between uh, history and postcards. Uh, so, so how do you guys kind of see that link? It's fascinating. Um, I did some of this research while I was still in college. Um, a lot of recorded history of in the moment, especially in micro instances where you're talking about a very regionalized kind of history, is recorded on postcards. Mm-hmm. Um, that and the history behind how certain areas came into you know being and how – one thing we looked at that was really kind of interesting was even how the post office system worked in Mystic, mm. where you could send a postcard from the Baptist church at 9 a.m. and somebody would have it by noon. No kidding. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's literally a written record of what's going on in the world right then and there. 
And when it came to the government, you know, they weren't wild about postcards because obviously, just like anything else, it was something they couldn't control. Mm -hmm. So up until I think 1898, the law was that if you mailed a private postcard, it cost more than just a government issued postcard. Okay. So it kind of it gives you an insight into law. It gives you a law insight into politics at the time. It gives you insight of what was going on in the daily lives of everybody from you know the elites and the bourgeois all the way down to the working class of the area. So um, the amount of history that you can you know decipher from that little three by five index card is unbelievable. Yeah. And did the early cards have enough information for you to be able to discern where the photos were taken or? The in some cases, drawings, I guess, right? Well, yeah. I, one thing I want to add uh, right before I answer that, mm -hmm. I want to piggyback off of what Martin said. Postcards are important to the uh, – depict what's important to the locals in that time. So there are some postcards that we have in our book that, to go on your question now, mm -hmm. that identified areas that – there were no written records of because these were kind of areas that the locals knew about and had uh, kind of affectionately named, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had to actually do a lot of uh, digging and talking to multiple different types of sources mm -hmm. to find out where these areas were. We had to identify them visually because the names that they were called by the locals and by society at the time uh, were never recorded in history oh, okay. books. Yeah, so, you so had to sort of match up. Uh, and well, I know. The, yeah, we'll the probably talk more about that. People's <clears throat> knowledge of the area today. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. there was some interviewing going on. There was some <laughs> driving around and actually looking at <laughs> sites <laughs> <laughs> in, in in the cases of places that no longer exist right. today, mm. as as they knew people knew them then in the yeah. 1800s and 1900s early 1900s so right. yeah so you got to know your town a little bit better yes. yeah it gives you kind <laughs> of more of a, of a cultural look as opposed to a clinical factual historical look right. So, yeah right. okay. it's one of those things where they say the best way to learn a foreign language is to be dropped in that country with a bunch of native speakers mm -hmm. the best way to learn about history on a local level is just to get in your car and drive around that place for hours and hours and hours <laughs> yeah. on it. make sure you have a map obviously <laughs> uh, that, that was one thing i learned and talk to people right yeah, talk right. to people yeah yeah mm -hmm. you found some key people mm -hmm. and being from the area it made it a little easier a probably. little easier yeah <laughs> <laughs> very good now you guys also told me a little bit about uh you know the difference between public and uh, private postcards, which I got, I guess you just got into, but uh, trade cards, you also mentioned that. What's, what's the differentiation and how did you put all these elements together in your book? The fascinating thing about trade cards is that they, initially they were never meant to be used postally. They were just what would be we consider the modern day equivalent of a business card. It okay. just has a photo of the place and it just has, you know, the contact information, how to get a hold of them um, okay. and everything else. So a business would have produced this? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the funny thing about that was, was that a lot of times with the way that cost of printing materials got went, people would use those trade cards as postage. They would literally just write something on the back of the card and mail them. Oh, okay. So, but they were, you know, there's a good 30 or 40 year kind of space when trade cards were kind of booming until you get to the fact where, you know, postcards were the thing. And But when it came to the postcards in the first year that Congress authorized them, I think something ridiculous like Three billion were sent. Oh it was a, just a ridiculous number <laughs> for a country of less than a hundred million people it's at kind this of a time. Craze, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> um, and, and I think that number kind of holds steady today. Obviously, mail is not what it is with email and everything else. But that's, that's about how many Facebook users there are, by the way. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe we it, haven't changed that much. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the whole public versus private dynamic was just it was a, it was an interesting thing to kind of see how the government wanted to undermine private enterprise in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And then they saw how popular it was, and they just finally gave it. It's like, okay, we'll just charge you for the postage. <laughs> government always thinks it knows best and rarely does. Yeah. <laughs> and the one trade card that we have here is it's a scene from Bank Square mm -hmm. um, for uh, Sheriff Jim E.F. Brown's livery stable. And uh, we found out it was located to the right of Miss Agnes Park's variety shop, which was built <laughs> by I.D. Miner in 1897 and purchased by Park in 1900, making her one of the chief businesswomen in the area. Yeah. So, so how did you put all that together? Uh, <laughs> lots of primary source documents, yes. looking at uh, historical maps. The Library wow. of Congress actually has a lot of oh, really? uh, maps from different uh, time periods. Really? Yeah. That's neat. Yeah, some okay. of, some of which research. were artfully rendered, so yeah. you had to do some. <laughs> Some comparing yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Well, you had a lot of great photographs, uh, yeah. and uh, several of them involved the Rossi Velvet Mill, mm -hmm. and there's some interesting history you, you had in there about the German printers that were here, I guess, around the World War I era. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that, because uh, that I guess that era has come and gone, but we still remember the, the Velvet Mill. Mm-hmm. 
It, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the, the Rossi Velvet Mill was actually a German-owned. Where was that, by the way? It was on Greenmanville Avenue. Okay. Yeah, and so that was actually German-owned until the start of World War I, um, which really surprised me. I found out that the U.S. government repossessed the Velvet Mill because it was run by German nationals. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's kind of scary to think about mm-hmm. in, in today's day, day yes, and age. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> they you kind can of, do that. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. And if you look at like the course of history, you know, they say people who uh, don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of true, but it's also like history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so mm. in World War II, you saw some of the same sure. repossession of Japanese. property. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And if we're not careful, you know, things could end up going that way mm. again. Sure. So yeah, and this actually ties back into postcard history too, because in 1907, they went to divided back. Right. So um, before 1907, postcards uh, you would write your message on the front of the card. There was right. like a okay. white border. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 1907, they decided to start putting addresses and messages on the back of the card. They mm-hmm. divided the back. But up until 19... 15, 19, 18-ish yeah. uh, postcards, a lot of them were printed in Germany because they had superior printing techniques. Uh, okay. When World War One started, that ended, and we started to produce a lot of the postcards here in the United States, mm. and they were of a much lesser quality. But yeah. That was another one so of the... it's interesting. Printing became sort of a national security thing, mm-hmm. like, like hearing some national security yeah. issues thrown mm-hmm. around for that. Definitely. Yeah. So it was kind of another symptom of World War One starting, the Rossi Velvet Mill getting re- mm. repossessed, um, the postcards. And, right. And just to be clear, changed. that's not the Velvet Mill in Stonington, which I think a it lot of people not. will think. It yeah. is not. No. Okay. And today, it houses the Mystic Seaport Museum archives. Oh, I okay. think so, yes. I believe. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and okay. uh, there might be a couple other businesses in there now. But yeah, it's right across the street from uh, the present day Mystic okay. Seaport. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting place. It is an interesting place, yeah. yeah. And Did you use those archives at all? Uh, More uh, for background research than yeah. actual material itself. Okay. Um, yeah. There was a lot of the postcards that they had were duplicates of things that we had, and a lot of it was stuff that was New London County related, but not so much Mystic related, oh, because, I mean, oh. everything kind of ran through New London for a sure. while. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, that, and it was one of those things where we wanted to make sure whatever materials we used, we were able to use kind of without encumbrance Mm -hmm. and we would have the right to kind of put the material together and make the product uniquely our own so Mm -hmm. um, they did a lot of good work for us as far as secondary background research they had some great primary source documents to use Mm -hmm. but you know it was just from a research perspective yeah pretty much everything we use is open source material so this is it's it's kind of a a condensing of (laughs) multiple different open source Right. Uh, resources that we used. We didn't. We wanted to make sure again that it was accessible, and we basically used what anybody has access to. But, mm-hmm. but the museum does have incredible archives, and anybody can just walk in there and look at these centuries old artifacts. Right. Yeah, it's it's a neat. Well, place. the key is having all this together in one spot. Yeah. too, you know. <laughs> I mean, it takes time. Not everyone wants to spend you know three years <laughs> working on this, stuff. and that's why we write <laughs> history books. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's cool because this is kind of a pictorial history. It's all. You have these – our book is basically just pictures of postcards and a 100-word captions that tell you the basics, the who, what, where, when, and why. And yeah. so it's it's kind of a neat way to, to look at history. I know yeah. people don't like to read Well, they're good captions, definitely. A lot yeah, of information, chock full of information. Yeah. It's great. Now, uh, on top of, you know, most people are used to seeing picture books with a lot of stuff about buildings, and, and you do have a fair <laughs> amount of that. Oh, yes. But That's you fair. also have some really good stuff about some people, and one of them is uh, this guy, Chaz Eldridge who just looks like an absolutely intriguing figure that I had never heard of before. So what should we know about Chaz? Chaz Eldridge was awesome, basically. That's pretty much all you need to know. (laughs) He was really cool. Yeah, you read about mystic history and you hear about all these esteemed individuals, right? The Charles Mallory, the ship captain, and all these... these, I guess, for lack of a better term, <laughs> wasps. You know? right, and yeah. Chaz Eldridge certainly was one, but mm. he was really unique. Uh, we actually read his... What, what was the era he was in, like in the 1800s? Late 1800s. Yeah. To, yeah. He died in 1915 or 16, okay. um, I believe, Yeah, uh, somewhere in that time period. Mm-hmm. So, 
But so, uh, not the, too many people. Oh, remember. later than that. <laughs> what the, oh, he passed later. I know his house burnt down later than that too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, his. Right. I think you're thinking of his son. His son is. Uh, that's right, and that's the interesting story within itself. Right. Uh, his son passed away, and there's kind of some dispute, but based on what we could tell, it was a suicide type thing. Mm. And so after that happened, Chaz just completely had a breakdown and left and went to Cuba mm. okay. for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What What was Chaz known for though? What? He was known for his Museum of Curios, which actually uh, follows what Martin was saying. He left Mystic because his son had committed suicide. Um, he was torn up. He went all over to these exotic locations. I think he went to the Caribbean. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Cuba, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he came back with all these weird artifacts from mm. his journeys <laughs> and actually built uh, a Museum of Curios, kind of like the today's Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. Okay. Uh, he claimed to have Harriet Beecher Stowe's purse yes. there. Yeah, really? <laughs> he had a four-pound bronze oh, cucumber. Four-foot bronze, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It okay. was, yeah, he had all kinds of weird things. And people would come to visit his mm. Museum of Curios and donate artifacts for him to use. And the <laughs> coolest thing I, I think about it was that it was free. So anybody yeah. could walk mm. in mm. and see it. It, do, it doesn't exist anymore, yeah. but I'm thinking that's what Mystic is missing today. <laughs> we well, need... we had the Emporium uh, <laughs> up until a few years ago. Yes. It was kind of the same. Yeah, but... <laughs> not at a museum. I yeah. feel like someone needs to bring that the Chaz Eldridge. Would, that would work. Yeah, yeah. it I'd would. I'd go for that. Maybe when that's I retire. pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, another uh, different type of tidbit in your book is uh, some stuff you had about the Hoxie House, uh, Scarlet Fever Academic. Uh, so tell me, uh, what was the Hoxie House and how was the uh, epidemic related to your investigation into the School of the Deaf uh, in uh, Mystic that was started by the Whipple family? Yes, yeah, so the Hoxie House today is uh, the Whalers Inn. It's actually across the way from S&P Oyster Company on the Stonington side of the river mm-hmm. um, and uh, across the way from Mystical Toys. Right. Um, so Hoxie House was a hotel and uh, it there was a, an, a rash of scarlet fever that swept through it, I believe early 1900s, yes. late 1800s. Um, and scarlet fever would would leave all kinds of uh, devastating effects mm-hmm. on the people that that fell ill with it. And so some people would, you know, recover death. And so the the oral school, the mystic oral school, was uh, created to help people who were deaf. And the Whipple family, I think, is from Ledger, and they started um, the the oral school in Mystic. It doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was a it was a the huge building help. Does. <laughs> yes, the building does. Well, right, there. right. Yes. Well, the new okay, so the original oral school doesn't exist. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, there's okay. different. There's <laughs> a, as with most things in Mystic, there were just several different iterations. I remember going through that place. And yeah, it was like yes. going through a, mm-hmm. an insane asylum or something. <laughs> it was very, very old. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. What yep. era was that for, for the oral school? I want to say early 1900s. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, right. I, I do know too that the state ended up Depends owning on what it, iteration and it was oh, it was open for a while, even after you know into the 80s, I think, mm-hmm. and then the state so. ended up. Per- Purchasing the property, and they, um, they decided not to do anything with it because yeah. funding wasn't there, and typical, you know, Connecticut budget problems. So, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was a, it. Was interesting to see that, but the legacy of just a you know one you know epidemic that went through the Hoxie House, carrying almost almost a hundred years of you know, it was yeah. a community service thing. I mean, it really sure. was. It started out as a private enterprise, and you know, it kind of became you know this state kind run thing but i mean you know it did a lot of good for a lot of people mm-hmm. yeah and the uh, the advent of modern medicine is pretty fascinating too um i grew up my mother's best friend uh, growing up was deaf and i used to think that it was somewhat of a normal thing it's mm-hmm. it's not so much anymore it used to be and you know of mm-hmm. course the oral school fell out of use because of sure. the yeah. yeah, advances in modern medicine, thankfully. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. One of those things you like to see, but yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Time, time marches mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you put this book together, you uh, have quite a few references to this fellow Ellery Twining. Um, <laughs> so tell me what you can about him, and uh, I assume he gave you access to a bunch of images, because uh, he seems to be everywhere in this book. Ellery, the my- you know the mystic enigma, as I like to refer to him <laughs> The about. man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> and he is a legend. Um <laughs> Ellery is an individual that gave us access to quite a bit of material. A lot of the material is uh, postcards that he himself put together. Um, mm-hmm. When the book and tackle store closed down, um, there was a huge gap in the market for postcards. I mean, with this being a tourist area as it is nowadays, there's still a lot of desire to have those men- mementos to either stick in a photo album or mm-hmm. send back home or do whatever you want to do. Yeah. So 
you know, he produces all of the material now for the Mystic Army Navy store. Okay. Um, and on top of that, he also has a large collection that he, you know, he obtained the archives from the Book and Tackle store when it went out of business. And he also managed to get a lot of stuff from the Emporium by the time it was going by the wayside. So he was just an in- indispensable, you know, you know, kind of vessel of knowledge for us, mm-hmm. uh, both as far as images and as far as background with some of those images go. And, and, you know, fantastic artist, fantastic photographer, fantastic, you know, human being to deal with. Mm-hmm. Writer, too. Yes. His images were instrumental because they allowed us to compare the then and the now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of places in Mystic that have been around forever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have we have historic photos here that show you what, mystic used to look like over a century ago in some cases Mm -hmm. his photographs and his postcards allowed us to compare those places to what they look like today so that people can kind of use it as almost like a walking tour yeah um and see what what mystic looks like now and it really hasn't changed in some (laughs) some some cases cases. you put them side by side yeah in some cases we did yeah Yeah. so he was really instrumental in, in helping us do that okay and uh, you mentioned to me also you made some discoveries, uh, I guess, things you didn't know about before you started this book, uh, Wolf's Den being one. Well, what is Wolf's Den? Wolf's Den is kind of, yeah, this is kind of like my baby for the book. So yes. Wolf's Den is this, uh, it's a rock formation. Um, and the, Where is it? It is, I'm trying to remember the road. It's next to the water treatment plant in Mystic. You know when you go, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be very. I usually try to avoid those places. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so when you're going over 95 uh, north, mm-hmm. you go over the bridge. You can kind of see it from 95, um, but it's on a it's on a side road next to the, I think it's. It's on. It's in the Avalonia present day Avalonia Nature Preserve. But right. What used to be Dean's Mill Park back exactly, in the day. Exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah, Dean's Mill Park was. A, it doesn't exist anymore. But um, it was this place that has all these different rocks that were essentially glacial. They're they're glacial okay. rocks, and they still exist yeah. today. And there were all these unique formations in the park that weren't recorded because everybody just recorded Dean's Mill Park as a place that people went in Mm -hmm. the late 1800s to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so um, this kind of harkens back to my childhood. I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here. When I was a kid, we used to climb boulders in Connecticut. And all the neighborhood kids had names for the boulders. (laughs) I grew up in Navy housing, so there was Big Mama Rock and (laughs) Elephant Rock. (laughs) 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 And I look at them now like, how what was I thinking? <laughs> I mean, these things barefoot. Really? Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> it's, it's again, this is like a, a cultural you were half thing. half the size, too. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it's, it's a very local cultural phenomenon to have names for these rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, but people had names for these rocks in Dean's Mill Park, one of which was the Wolf's Den. Okay. And we have uh, a couple pictures of the Wolf's Den um, in the book. Um, but we actually had to do some investigation. There was no written records. And I thought, hmm, you know, I'll read out to some of the hikers in the area because Connecticut has some pretty avid hikers. Mm -hmm. So we found um, a woman named Beth Sullivan who blogs for the um, Avalonia Avalonia, uh, Nature, I think it's actually technically the Avalonia Nature Conservancy. And I said, hey, have you, you know, have you seen this rock formation? You hike everywhere. And she instant, she's so great. She instantly knew where it was. She said, (laughs) I know exactly where it is. I can take you there. It's on the water treatment um, property, the the water treatment company's property. So she said, you know, you're not supposed to go back there. You can drive on the road and go see. So we <laughs> did. But yeah, we, we had to, this was something that we couldn't use history books to do. But we identified where uh, Wolf's Den is. And Miss mm-hmm. Tuxet Miss Tuxet Rock happened. <laughs> Martin actually identified that one with Beth's help. Yeah. It mm-hmm. was it was hilarious because we knew that the rock was in the what's the reservoir now. And we didn't know where. Mm-hmm. And it was just frustrating for me. I was, to be honest, Jade had made this great discovery as far as the wolf did. And it was just like, <laughs> I need to find something to kind of put my mark on this thing, too. <laughs> and so we're at the wolf's den. And we climbed up there and took our pictures and did all the fun stuff to verify our landmark. And we look across the river and there's this rock sticking out. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, that was, that was, that was that the was rock. It. They were literally right okay. across from one another. Okay. And, and we went back later on. You could see where there had been holes drilled into the back of the rock for a ladder. And if you look real close at the uh, postcard, really? you can see a ladder on the back huh, of the rock. So people so. used to jump off of the rock? Yeah, or, I'm assuming yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Huh. Better than a float. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so that funny. Yeah, that's, I think, the coolest part of the book because it really gets behind 
the technical history and talks about like right. what it meant for for mm. natives, locals yeah. and natives. So yeah. did you have a historic uh, shot of of the rock or did you do your own photo for that? Uh, in the post in yeah, the book? In the oh, it, no, we have the actual postcard. Um oh, you do? it does okay. say that it was it says it it identifies it as near westerly, which is another problem with some of these postcards. Mm, right. <laughs> is that they misidentify a lot of the right. locations. So you yeah. really have to know. To double check. You know. Yeah, right. what you're talking about when mm-hmm. you write these books. Otherwise, like being a journalist, people tell you stuff, and you got to double check. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. basically, yeah. yeah. I, I, that happened to me the other day, where I had to physically go someplace to yep. see if it was true that yeah. somebody told me something. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, so uh, so that's great. And uh, finally, Jade, I saw on your resume that you were a direct descendant going back generations, uh, and your your ancestors were Acadian, I guess, or one of the Acadian yeah. founders. So what is Acadia? And tell me a little bit about your family's background. Uh, so Acadia is present-day Nova Scotia, and it was founded by, uh, well, the Mi'kmaq Native Americans lived, or not Native Americans, I guess mm. you'd call them First Nations okay. in uh, Canada now, but... Um, um, they lived there before the French got there. Mm-hmm. Um, the French got there in the 1600s, and um, it was meant to be a French colony. France kind of abandoned it after they sent a couple colonists out there. Mm-hmm. And so the colonists began to kind of inter- actually so really intermingle with the Mi'kmaq tribe. Mm-hmm. They intermarried. They right. had uh, children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the French kind of had forgotten about that territory until the British kind of set their sights on it. <laughs> The as they do. Yeah. And so my, my family got there. They came from Martes, France. Um, and there's actually um, a plaque in Martes on an, uh, a 12th century church uh, dedicated to Antoine Landry, mm-hmm. who left Martes and went to Acadia and helped found that. And now there is a plaque in a uh, chapel there. The chapel was burned down when the British invaded, mm. as they do. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so the the plaque is there. Um, Antoine Landry is my, I think, 11th great-grandfather. Okay. Um, but Acadia is really special because it was one of the only places in the New World where um, colonists had truly – uh, kind of become one with the Native Americans. Mm. And when the British came, they had a, a really hard time taking over that place mm-hmm. because the first thing they tried to do was separate the white colonists from right. the Native Americans. Sure. And they were... <laughs> Too many absolute, family connections. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. not. Yeah. That's my brother. Yeah. That's my sister. That's right. my wife. Hmm. And so um, eventually they just put people on ships and sent them off and mm-hmm. said, see ya. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my eighth great-grandfather was born in exile in Boston, actually, yeah. exile yep. from Acadia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it became Nova Scotia when the British uh, took it over. Before that was Nouvelle, France. Gotcha. And yeah. Okay. But yeah. I thought that was yeah. an interesting little it's, slice yeah, of life. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And parenthetically, uh, you know, you did grow up around here and you spent yeah. quite a bit of time here. And you were actually instrumental at one point in establishing the uh, Matthew Chu Art Scholarship locally. And as mm-hmm. our listeners probably remember, Matt was uh, unfortunately a, a random murder victim several years back on the streets of New London. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, what can you tell me about Matt and, and the fun you started? Matt was a Renaissance man. He <laughs> uh, lived in New London. Um, he worked at Two Wives Pizza. Um, he actually won an award for his Per and Gorgonzola pizza <laughs> uh, during the, the the food festival that New London oh, has. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah, and he so he was pretty awesome. He was a painter. He was a DJ. Uh, pretty much everyone in New London knew him. His favorite hangout was the Oasis, mm. <laughs> which is still a pretty fun place for people to go. If you're in your 20s anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you know what? Love all serval. I think he'd be happy to see anyone there. But yeah, he was a cool guy. And so he was walking home from work in um, October of 2010 and was murdered ran- at random, which is yeah. a pretty rare thing. Really? Yeah. Amazing. People rose up after that and they thought, you know, the, the people who killed him said that they were bored and we thought, gosh, you know, that's really terrible for people to feel so hopeless mm. that this is entertainment. Right. Right. So we wanted to do something to help. Um, people maybe have some sliver of hope. And so we created the Arts Scholarship, the Matthew Chu Memorial Scholarship for the Arts, which Mm. has no GPA requirement. It is available to uh, musicians, to um, visual artists, Mm -hmm. any form of art whatsoever. Um, Yeah. To anybody or just New London folks? To Southeastern. It falls under the umbrella of the Southeastern uh, Connecticut 
Foundation, I believe it's okay. The Community Foundation. Community Foundation. Eastern that's it. Yeah, they're yeah. right here on Bank Street. Actually, it's Eastern <laughs> Connecticut now. They, oh. they expanded oh, their scope. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's the umbrella that it falls under, and it's available to southeastern. I think I, southeastern southeastern Connecticut uh, students. All right. How do you students. apply for that? Oh, uh, you just go on the website and apply. There's okay. no real the Community Foundation. Yeah. Okay. There's no real qualifications. That that was kind of the goal is Great. is to not restrict access. What's the max available? Ah, uh, last I knew, gosh, I'm, I'm not the only one who manages it. Okay. There's also, I'm a co-founder. Um, right. His family helps to manage it. Um, Amanda Bashand is, uh, actually was one of his very good friends. She also helps to manage it. Mm-hmm. So I haven't actually looked at it in a while, but last I knew there was a $500 scholarship given to a student who went to UConn for me- to teach music. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. good job doing that. That's uh, great that you were able Thank to you. get that done. Yeah. So one last question. Uh, the panel discussion I want to get back to on August 18th, uh, uh, I, I assume it's free. Uh, uh, yes. So, uh, and your books will be available, I'm sure, on site. Everyone's um, books. Every panelist. <laughs> yes. Okay. And you can get them all signed. Yeah. This is the one... I, 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 I've never seen that many authors in one place. So if exactly. you want to get right. your book signed yeah. by all these people, this is the time to yeah. do it. We used right. to have a book festival in New London. That might have been oh, the only other time you could yeah. get that kind of oh, thing going on. We should bring that back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, hey, you're, hey, you're here for a month. Come <laughs> <Maybe>. on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs> okay. the, the look I Good. just got kind of says it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so if people want to attend, uh, what uh, is there a place where they can go to get some more information about your uh, sure. event? Sure. There's several places. I mean, we have a Facebook event for it, obviously, uh, as social media tends to kind of demand nowadays. What's it called? Uh, uh, it's just the 2018 Groton Mystic Local History Roundtable. Okay. Uh, just, you can search that. Um, Real simple. <laughs> yeah, I know. Real simple. Uh, but there's also information on the Groton Public Library's website. Um, there's information on my website. You can go to www.mearlsmith.com. That's M and then the name Earl, E-A-R-L, smith.com. And there's information and articles and all of the data for the roundtable that will be there. Um, and then, you know, there, there's been articles in various, you know, other forms of media that have kind of put it out there. So, I mean, there, there's information out there. But, yeah, the, the Facebook and my website would probably be the best places to get your information for it. And the Groton Public Library le- website, obviously, because they do a fantastic job. Okay, great. Things. Well, all you history buffs out there, I hope you can make it. That sounds like a great event. Uh, that's it for today's podcast of Recorded History. I'd like to thank our guests, Jade Huguenin and Martin Smith, and remind you to find this and other local podcasts at theday.com backslash podcast. Till next time, I'm your host, Lee Howard, and I can always be reached at recordedhistory at theday.com for comments and critiques, so don't be shy. History is not for the faint of heart.